reading. Luke chapter 7, beginning at verse 11, I want to echo uh, Betty Kay's prayer of thanksgiving for your giving. Thank you. Uh, you have indeed proven over the years, uh, the, the nine and a half years that I've been here, that, that you are indeed a giving congregation in many, many, many ways. I would simply remind you also that um, uh, February was a little interesting month with the snow, and we missed a Sunday in there. Uh, and so fortunately, this month we have five Sundays. And so if, uh, if you know folks that uh, maybe are weekly givers and, and had, uh, have not had an opportunity to uh, make that one up, it would be helpful for us. Thank you, as always, for all you do. Luke chapter 7, Jesus has just healed the centurion's servant. It's an interesting story. Uh, they come, they tell Jesus that uh, this servant is uh, in need of Jesus. And Jesus is on his way. And, and even before he gets there, the centurion sends out a messenger that says, Look, you, you don't even need to come. I'm someone who controls people, and all you need to do is speak the word. And Jesus says, Never have I found such faith, and the centurion servant is healed. And then Luke drops this little short story in Luke chapter 7, verses 11 through 17. Soon afterwards, Jesus went to a city called Nain. And his disciples were going along with him, accompanied by a large crowd. Now, as he approached the gate of the city, a dead man was being carried out, the only son of his mother, and she was a widow. A sizable crowd from the city was with her. Now, when the two processions met, when the Lord saw her, he felt compassion for her and said to her, do not weep. And Jesus came up and touched the coffin, and the bearers came to a halt. Then Jesus said, Young man, I say to you, get up. The dead man sat up and began to speak, and Jesus gave him back to his mother. Now fear gripped them all. And they began glorifying God, saying, A great prophet has arisen among us, and God has visited his people. And this report concerning him went out all over Judea and in all the surrounding district. This is the word of God for us today. Thanks be to God. When the procession left the widow's home that morning in the town of Nain, her son's body was lying in the coffin, and she was not planning a celebration. No one was. The son was her only child, and she had already buried her husband. So not only was she without the comfort of family anymore, she was also likely in that culture, in that day, and in that time, without any further means of support. Her future life was also in danger. There was no expectations, no hope of celebration for the woman or the crowd that followed her as they left that morning. They mourned, they wailed, they made their slow way to the cemetery outside of town. Now as that group is leaving town, emerges and gets to the city gate and begins to go through, they meet another procession entering the city. Large crowd, one that we know to include Jesus. And so Jesus leaves that crowd and approaches the mother. And the word says he looked at her. And then speaks. Do not weep. Now, if the crowd hadn't hushed before that, I'm sure it does when the man touches the coffin. These are Jewish folks. You don't touch 
dead bodies or the things that carry dead bodies. And when Jesus asked the dead man to rise, and he does, the text doesn't say, but I'm guessing that more than one or two or three jaws dropped wide open. Now, once the shock wears off, it's not normal for dead people to raise up. Once that shock wears off, they cut loose, the scriptures tell us. It does say a great fear gripped them. Now, you remember our story last week? They were afraid. Remember we asked the question, why do some people ask Jesus to leave and some ask Jesus to stay? Don't know, but this case... In their fear, they seemed to want Jesus to stay. For they began to proclaim and sing out loud, A great prophet has risen among us. God has looked favorably on God's people. You see, they know the story of Elijah and the widow's son that was given back to that widow. And now they are their own story. And they are, as we would say, whooping it up and hollering all over the place. What was a dreadful morning is now a great morning. She continues, she has lost her husband, but she lost her son, but now has received that son back. And it is great that she's likely saved from living on the streets. It's great that the crowd rejoices and glorifies God. They don't ask him to leave. They embrace him in the truth. And it's great that the celebration is heard all across the countryside. But I want to go back to this text. Because there's something about this text that for me is different and struck me different than many of the other healing stories of Jesus. It is a very quiet text. Notice that until the end, Neither crowd is recorded as saying anything. The disciples, who normally are very chatty, don't say a word. The mother does not yet seem to recognize Jesus, and even if she does, she doesn't run up to him like so many others and say, Oh, Jesus, Son of God, I know that you can do something if you just want to. That doesn't occur. Even Jesus himself in this text only speaks ten words. Normally Jesus has more to say. Or certainly the crowd around him or his disciples. And then here's the one that the rest of the story I'd love to hear. Jesus commanded the boy to rise and the man sat up and he began to speak. Don't you wonder what he said? Oh, that was interesting. Let me tell you what I saw. That seems to be the current thing when people have come back to life. Or I wonder if he said, looked, sat up and looked around at all the crowds, and now this extra one went, wow, I'm pretty impressed. All of you were at my funeral. Thank you. We don't know. The word is not recorded for us. The mother nor the son are even recorded as saying thank you. There's just not a lot of recorded dialogue in this story. It's a very quiet story as the stories go. Isn't it interesting how we bring so much stuff to these texts? But if you look at this particular story, it's quiet. But maybe it's quiet for a reason. Have you ever thought about a quiet God? A silent God? God. Hebrew scholar Richard Friedman has written a book entitled The Disappearance of God. And it's not that God is no longer present. He literally goes back as as a scholar of the Old Testament scriptures. And he begins in Genesis and he goes all the way through to the minor prophets and he records and he observes and records and shares to us the slow but steady withdrawal of God from personal interactions with humans. Go back and think about a minute. In Genesis, God's face to face all over the place. And he does these incredibly big and powerful kinds of things. Now, 
he already begins to withdraw a little bit in Exodus, but he's still there, and the, and the seas part, and nations are run out of town. I mean, when God acts, whole nations fall. But by the time we get to the minor prophets, God only now speaks through others and typically through visions and dreams he doesn't even meet face to face with his spokespersons anymore then of course we have Jesus who comes on the scene in whom we proclaim and who we believe and I believe for certain that God dwelt fully yet differently and it's one of the things that that caused the people of God in the day of Jesus to miss him because Jesus didn't act like the God they knew. We know the God who spoke to Moses. We know the God who called out Abraham, but you, we, you don't act like that. And when you stop and think about it, Jesus was a little more quiet on the scene. His healings were typically face-to-face, -face, one at a time. He spoke to crowds, but when he did, nations did not fall. It's like Fred Craddock who caught wind of this, and he said these words, The voice of God in Jesus is not a shout. In Jesus, the revelation of God comes to us as a whisper. In order to catch it, we must hush, lean forward, and trust that what we hear is indeed the voice of God. We live in a culture that is immersed in noise. We have grown up in a religious setting that seems to say God is always in the big and the mighty and the powerful. But maybe this story is here at this point in time and for us to tell us something, another truth about God that is just as true. Maybe this story is reminding us that it's not what we say or do not say in our lives, but leaning in and being quiet enough to catch what God is doing in any moment, at every moment. Now granted... It's hard to miss what God is doing when a dead person is raised to life. I'm still not sure what I would do if I was ever preaching a funeral and they sat up and started talking. Yet most of our days are not lived around events like that. They are ordinary events. Remember that we are listening to a dead man being raised, but we are just a few weeks away from experiencing again the event which the closest followers of Jesus thought that the voice of God had been silenced forever. So in between the raising of a dead man and thinking that God's voice is gone forever lies our daily, ordinary lives. And they are guided by laws and by boundaries. And that is just what makes this story in the Old Testament story so important to us. For the God of Elijah and the God of Jesus will not abandon us to the ordinary things of our lives that seem to have a defined ending to them. God has too much compassion, Luke tells us. This woman and those town people began the day believing that nothing was going to change the outcome that they had envisioned. They were headed to the cemetery. This is the way life is, they said. You are born, you die, and nothing is going to change that. Yet Luke tells us that Jesus is moved by compassion. And so will not leave well enough alone. But Jesus, in truth, in order to combat death with life and mourning with joy, as the psalmist said to us. And so it is. It may be hard to detect at times. Again, a dead man rising catches all of our attention. But what about the normal, ordinary events of your day? 
Those moments that for you bring silence to your soul. And you wonder, is God alive? The story tells us indeed that God is among us. That God is breaking into the ordinary, the mundane, the time being in order to encourage and to support, to restore and eventually to redeem our lives. The story reminds us that God is just as present to us during these ordinary times of our lives as the extraordinary, during times of loneliness as well as contentment, during times of scarcity as well as times of abundance, during times of mourning as well as times of rejoicing, during times when the voice of God is unmistakable as well as the times when the voice of God seems impossible to hear. It is the season of Lent. Hopefully, you are pausing more than normal. Hopefully, you are stopping and listening more, talking less. We are in the season when we are approaching that time when the Word stops speaking for a while. And remember, even for Jesus. My God, my God, why have you gone silent? As I stop and think during this season, I am reminded and I jotted down that many of the most significant moments I have experienced were in silence. Sunrises. And sunsets. When I stand at the ocean or on the side of the mountain vista and I look out, all around me goes silent. When I watch it snow, granted I'm a little bit over that one this year, but when it was coming down, Is there a silence greater than watching it snow? I remember seeing my bride's face for the first time. And there was no other sound. I am privileged now to watch other brides and grooms see each other for the first time. And the silence is still the same. being in the room and watching as a loved one dies it is silent and holding my children for the first time there was no sound maybe the story today in the season in which we are in Maybe it is saying to you and to I, to us, that we need to say less and listen more. That in a world that is seemingly now addicted to noise, there is the need for the silence of grace to overwhelm us. And understand that the grace will come from God. It was God who saw her. It was Jesus who stopped. It was Jesus who looked. And it was Jesus who felt compassion. But are there times we miss that compassion and that grace? Because we are so busy filling our world with noise. I find it interesting that in the earlier parts of that Old Testament story when God seemed to be more personal and more present that a lot of God's words began with these words Hear, O Israel Maybe we've lost that word 
here. Well, people of God at First Baptist Church of Columbia, your God is among you with compassion and grace. May you find healing this day. Father, we come before you and in these moments we will just simply be quiet. Father, fill the silence of our hearts and our lives and our ears with your grace and your compassion. This we pray in the name of